welcome to Cooking the Books with me, Val McDermott. And on today's visit to the Fiction Kitchen, we're going to do another Scottish staple, Scotch broth. Now, this is something that divides people in Scotland. Is soup a meal or is it not a meal? Is it central heating for the soul or is it a starter? Me, I am of the view that proper, well-made, homemade soup is a meal. Soup's a starter or soup's something you have with something else. As you can see, this is a divide that goes right to the very heart of our nation. So, we're going to make Scotch broth. Central heating for the soul. And I oh. better put my peony on or I'll be in trouble. I'm really disappointed if I only get soup as a meal. I keep thinking, what's coming next? But good soup is filling and, and makes you feel warm and toasty and loved inside. No? You've got to get out more. Oh. I can't get out more, can I? I'm in lockdown. So first we take our pan and into that we put a knob of butter and a wee bit of oil to stop the butter burning. I think today we'll go with a wee bit of the garlic rapeseed oil. Not very much though, just, just want the faintest bit. So first of all we take an onion. I've just cleaned that. Now, as you can probably hear, this is just getting ready for stuff to be dumped into it, so in goes the onions. I have to say that I hope none of my friends who are professional chefs are watching me chopping things so Badly. Oops. In goes the onions. Next comes the leek. Take the root off the leek. Usually strip the outside one off because it's a bit minging. Uh, cut it back to where it starts to split because after the, uh, beyond that point you can sometimes get dirt in it and you have to strip it away a wee bit. Seems so awfully wasteful. Well, you could always wash it and use it, but I'm just profligate. As you can see, my chopping skills with the leeks are a wee bit better. Into the pan go the leeks. So we've had a decent sized onion and the leek so far. And next we have a carrot. You're not bothering to peel it? Theoretically you should peel it, but you know, so much for theory. By the time you get them in the supermarket they've been pretty thoroughly washed anyway. Yeah, but then people have touched them with their covid -y hands. Now that was a big carrot. You could use, of course, two smaller carrots, or you could do what my mother used to do uh, and chop one small carrot, medium sized carrot, in like that in pieces and grate the other one in to make the soup a bit thicker if you want it to be a bit thicker. But trust me, this soup's thick. So is this Jason's soup then? <laughs> You're not allowed to call Jason thick. It's not nice. All you can say about Jason is he's not the brightest button in the box, but his heart's in the right place. The next ingredient is the potatoes. Any kind of potatoes will do really, just tends to be whatever's lying about in the bottom of the fridge really. You just chop them into weird irregular shapes. Okay, I'm going to speed up from now onwards, because it's going to be boring watching you chop in lots and lots of potatoes. Unless you cut a finger off. So 
So here we have the chopped potatoes and they're about to be added to the pan with the other melange of vegetables. Some of which will end up on the stove top and the floor. I feel as clumsy as I am. Took you all hoover after this. <laughs> so give it a good stir and I'm now just about ready to start adding the key ingredients that make this scotch broth and not just any other kind of vegetable soup. And that is the scotch broth mix. Not haggis. Not haggis, no. Where did you grow up? So, um, my mother used to have separate jars of all these different pulses. So you've got your barley and your lentils and your dried peas and your split peas. And of course there would also be dried butter beans as well. But honestly, these days it's just as convenient to have the scotch broth mix, which you can buy from any good supermarket or grocery store. So, with my usual precision of measurement, here we go. It's one handful. Just let me have a wee look at the handful so that... Yeah. Two handfuls. And a wee got extra because... because. So we'll give that a bit of a rumble about. And now we're going to be starting to add liquid to this. And the first bit we're going to add is a tin of tomatoes, a tin of chopped tomatoes. Again, this is one of those areas where there is some variation according to individual recipes. So my gran always used tomato puree, but my mum used tin tomatoes, so it's up to you what you like. Personally, I like the tin tomatoes. I like bits of chunky bits of tomato that appear from time to time on your plate. Could you use fresh tomatoes? Why would you do that? I've never used fresh tomatoes when I'm making soup because fresh tomatoes, are, if they're any good, are much better in other forms. You know, like in a salad or a sandwich or something like that. But I feel like a waste of really good tomatoes to put them in soup. Well, that's true. So much deliciousness in soup, you don't really need that as well. So, now it goes in a wee stock gel, we use your chicken stock gel. In normal circumstances I would tend to have proper stock on the go, but in these straightened circumstances of not everything being readily available, stock gel is just as good really. Um, and, it, and it gives you a bit of extra flavour. You can of course use other stock gels, or stock cubes if you're a vegetarian. Uh, you, could, you could easily substitute a vegetable stock or some other form of bouillon. So there's that, and now we get the water. Oh, I get the water, do I? From the recently boiled kettle. I can't, I can't hold a recently boiled kettle, can I? I mean, you know, I have very many skills, but that's no one of them. But then we go with the water. Now, you'll know your own stuff your own kitchen utensils better than I will. So basically it's... It's going to melt. It's going to melt. Apparently I'm going to melt the kettle. Um, but that's the sort of consistency you want. I might add a wee bit more water to that really. But that's sort of where you want it to go and then you just sit there and let it boil. Looks pretty, looks pretty watery to me already. I'm just going to add a bit more water in so that I get every last bit of goodness out of the tin tomatoes. I'm putting it in the tomato tin. So there we go. That's going to come to the boil. Put the lid on it. You want it to come? If you want to come to the boil. Whose soup is this? It'll take longer to boil if I get a lump tea. So, as we're waiting for it to boil, we can also add some seasoning. Now this is where the one really non-traditional element of my scotch broth comes in. My beloved gave me this, it's a tub of flor de sal with mushroom powder in it as well. And I really like the kind of savoury oomph this gives to lots of soups and stews now. So, umami. No, my mummy didn't use this. Oh. That bit about that much oh, in. I suppose it's about a level teaspoonful. In it goes. And the other thing, of course, is a bit of pepper. Mm -hmm. 
This is just the base seasoning. Obviously, once it's in your plate, you may want to add more and different seasoning to taste. You know, some chefs don't let you put salt and pepper on the table. I'm not like that. You're not really a chef, are you? What's that? Because I'm a woman. Is that the thing that men are chefs and women are cooks? More to do with presentation. Oh, get you. Lid on, wait for it to boil. So if you were close enough to this pot, you would hear it having come to what we technically call a rolling boil. Oh yes, look at that. Now this is the point where you want to turn it down to make it simmer. Now, I'm going to put it in the bottom oven of my agar, but you can put it on a, a very, very low ring for a couple of hours and that will do the trick just the same. My mother used to make her soup in a thing she called the waterless cooker, which I think was a kind of pressure cooker. But it always baffled me because she never cooked anything in it that didn't have lots of liquid. So it was either soups or stews or whatever stock that got done in the waterless cooker. So I'm not entirely sure what it was, but it made great soup. So we're going to leave that in the bottom oven for a couple of hours. And then when we take it out, we're going to let it cool down because it's a well-known fact that second day soup is the best. And the best way to achieve second day soup without having to wait for the second day is to let it cool down and then heat it up again in the evening when you have it for your tea, which is what I will be doing tonight. So we'll see you later when it's all done and in the bowl. So this has come out of the oven and it's cooled down and this is basically what it should look like. Approximately, obviously. Yours will look different because mine looks different every time. So what I'm going to do now is take a few ladlefuls out of this and heat it up in a wee pan and then have it for my tea. So here I am heating it up in a wee pan on the stove ready to have for my tea. Which I'm certainly looking forward to after the brisk walk we've just had around the centre of Edinburgh. And I like to do a very non-traditional thing. I like to add a spoonful of wild garlic pesto to my scotch broth. Now this is only available in the springtime of the year, as I said, we've come to the end of the season almost. And so I do sometimes do a thing that purists will recoil in horror from. I sometimes put in a heaped teaspoonful of boursin, that French cheese with garlic and herbs. And it's lovely. It just adds another dimension to the Scotch broth. And I'm sorry to my ancestors who are probably burrowing in their boxes like Peary's right now. And to the person who has to share a house with you. Aye, but we're socially distanced from vampires. And here's the soup just coming through the boil. Baby wee bubbles on the surface, that'll be the boil. Oh, looks lovely. And now I'm going to pour it on top of the white garlic in the bowl. And there'll now be a subtle colour change as I stir the wild garlic pesto into the scotch broth. It's kind of so gone a muddy brown. That colour. You see occasional bits of bright green rising to the surface. I tell you, it's a lovely thing. Very lovely thing. Oh, this is going to be so good. I'm sorry, I can't wait. Mmm. Oh, that's great. That's a broad plate of soup. It's a bowl. It's a plate. It's a bowl. If you had it on a plate, it would all run off. It's the vernacular. It's a broad plate of soup. No one says that's that. That's the expression. They do. No one says that. Life. Not in Perth. Ah, oh, well, that's Perth. The petty bourgeois capital of Scotland where they can't even pronounce scone. Or the part of the world that understands that you put soup in a bowl. Because if not, it runs off. Things I have to put up with. The first time Scotch broth appears in any of my books, as far as I can ascertain without reading all of them from start to finish, is of course in the first Karen Pirri novel, The Distant Echo. Uh, and here is what happens when Alex Gilby, who's one of the central characters in the book, returns home from university. 
Alex swallowed a spoonful of soup. He hadn't felt hungry, but at the first taste of homemade scotch broth, he'd realised he was ravenous. The last he'd eaten had been at the party, and he'd lost that twice over. All he wanted now was to fill his belly, but he was going to have to sing for his supper. Terrible thing happened last night, he said between mouthfuls. There was a girl murdered, and it was us that found her. Well, me actually, but Siggy and Beard and Mondo were there with me.